Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie. This Friday afternoon, you're very welcome along to Friday Night Racing. It's Jerry Gilroy and Johnny Ward with you. Every Friday afternoon, we stream at 3 o'clock on all of our social channels. The best place these days to get us is on the OTB Sports app. You can get that in the App Store. Just search OTB Sports. And then every Friday evening, we're on Off The Ball on News Talk from 8 o'clock. And this is going to be a good show, Johnny. I can feel it in my bones. Well, and you're making a very big call there, Ger. I remember when I was studying journalism in DCU, um, I can't remember exactly who it was, but it was one of my lecturers, and I, I started off the article by saying, what follows is an interesting story of such and such, and he said, well, don't tell the reader straight away that it's interesting, because he might he or she might think it's crap. But it is Tony Mullen, so it's not going to be crap. Well, there you go. And I, I would fundamentally disagree with uh, your journalism teacher, I would say, you know. Mm. Mm. They were. It was a long time ago now in DCU, uh, Jerry. You know, I'm talking 20 years at this stage. You are so. an old man. It's true. I well, am getting well, older with every day in lockdown as well. Let's get things going. Let's relive an amazing moment from Longchamp last Saturday with Princess Zoe from the depths of hell. Take it away. Elquin is still in front as they came towards the top of the straight. In fact, he's opened up a break of probably a good six or seven lengths. In second placing is uh, battling away there. Princess Zoe, call the win, plugs on, followed then by Winstoss inside the final 300, and it's Elquin well in advance plugging on, trying to stay on. Princess Zoe, she is slowly but surely pegging back. Elquin, he's getting very tired, but he still has a four-length advantage inside the final 200. Princess Zoe, she's trying hard on the near side. She is starting to rally. Elquin is in front, inside the 100. Is the post going to be able to be picking up? Uh, uh, Princess Zoe, the outside, she moved up. She grabbed the lead. She outstayed him. And Princess Zoe went home to beat Elquin. Tony Mullins, good afternoon to you. How are you doing? Good, very good. Does that uh, make the hairs in the back of your neck stand up a little bit again? For about the 120th time this week. <laughs> I, I, we were saying in the office today, there's almost nothing as exciting in, in life as watching a horse come from the depths of hell and pip another horse on the line. It's great for us who aren't involved. For you standing there watching the big screen, what was that like? Well, you see, it was a little bit mixed because at the 500, the lads I was watching it with, they were all sort of hoping. And I said, look, she hasn't won. She hasn't won. Down to the three, down to the two. And suddenly, coming near the one, I said, she's not going to get there. And, you know, well, I was delighted still to be placed in the group one, you know, I get, and my heart went down a bit. And the next thing, you know, we were on the stand, a huge stand, and there was only about 10 of us on a stand that would fit 10,000. And uh, when she got her nose up onto his tail, and I could see her quickening, uh, I had just had to be careful. I nearly just lost my knees. I never got such a surge of excitement in, you know, to go from being very comfortable to being a little disheartened to the massive surge of excitement in, in all in 15 seconds. It was just something... Uh, I'd heard about, but it never happened to me before. There is something mad about being involved in the game of racing, and we talk about it all the time, is that, you, you know, you, you chase that high so often, but most of the time, you never get it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, our game is, is hard from the point of view of, um, you have a massive, you know, a massive strike rate if you can maintain 20%. So that means four times out of five, you lose. And that's for the top lads. So can you imagine, you know, most people have an average strike rate of about um, 8%, 9%, you know, so that's less than one in 10 times you're going to have a success. And here we are talking about the level of success is it's uh, Arc Weekend at Longchamp. It's like the cream of the crop. Does that add extra to it? Because, uh, you know... Does it what? <laughs> Jesus, man, sure. I mean, you know, it's the world stage. And, uh, you know, you, you just can't get any better. Like, I mean, it, it, it's like practicing hurling here in Gorn and then suddenly being in Croke Park. Yeah. And with this horse as well, which has such a dramatic backstory. Yeah, well, it's an amazing story that, you know, um, 
first of all, she's a well-exposed handicapper that failed to win in 10 runs last year. The whole season, she had 10 runs and didn't win a race. Now, she ran well. She was second a couple of times. And uh, then she comes here and we upped her in distance significantly and it seemed to bring about a huge improvement. Then we were quite lucky that the rain came for us every day because a cut in the ground definitely suits her. And uh, then, of course, the first day we famously got beaten and, um, you know, that then it, 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 it got a bit of a flattener for a while. But then I knew going to the ladies' race in the Curra, uh, I said, nothing will beat this one. I just thought maybe it was one of the biggest certainties I ever ran. And she won accordingly, so I was vindicated. Then going on to Galway, I was hopeful. We had to, you know, Jodie Townland rode her in the Curra, which is a, a ladies' race, which was the ladies' derby. Then we go to the, uh, to Galway and we end up in an amateur race, which is known as the amateur derby. Um, and we have to get another jockey. And then she wins that in a dramatic finish. She burst through at the last 100 yards. And then we go down to the Saturday at the festival meeting in Galway again. And again, we have to get another new jockey. So, I mean, for all these different jockeys to ride her, and she comes up with the same result every time. Now, they give her lovely rides, each one of them. And um, then we came on to the listed race. And, you know, the listed race was very exciting because Ennis Diamond was third in that, and she was second in the English Oaks. So I knew we were tying into group form at this stage. And then about seven, eight days before the French race, Joey Sheridan came down and wrote her work here. And I was often uh, up on the gallops here for the last 30 years wondering, you know, what would it be like to have a group one horse? And then I said to myself a few times, you know, would you even know if you had one? <laughs> like, you know, the minute I had one, I knew it. I knew when she worked that morning, Jackie, the girl who uh, is the head traveling girl here and, and looks after Zoe, uh, she was coming down that day and I said, we had a sort of a made arrangements because of all this Corona and the uh, isolating and that when you come home, she wasn't going to go. And uh, I just said, Jackie, this is too important. I said, you just have to go. And uh, she was looking at me like, you know, we had arrangements made another way. And I said, Jackie, this is just too important. I think we'll want to maybe win a race here. And, um, you know, I felt it in my bones she wasn't going to get beat. So, um, I don't have, you sent, have you sent out a few mass cards to Annie Punter who uh, managed to back her in Navin when she was beaten off 64 in light of uh, what she's achieved since? Yeah, well, you see, it, it was a very unlucky thing what happened. I know the mayor um, and she's had old problems mm. and mm. he's a bit crutchy and Maybe most conventional trainers would be saying that one now she has no stride and she's but I knew she had a potential and I went to the Cora about ten uh, less five or six days before that race in Navin for Nile McCullough to ride her in a bit of work. And he rode her and was very happy and I when he jumped down I said, No Nile, I said the reason I got you here was so she'd know her, so she wouldn't think that she was uh, uh, a, a bad mover you know, that you'd know that she changes when she moves on. And of course, then Niall got hurt and we got Shane Foley at the last minute and Shane didn't know her. And I think that, uh, and you couldn't blame him for it, I think halfway down the back, Shane thought that there was something wrong with her because early in a race, when she has in her sleep mode, as I call it, she just goes along like a one that needs a pair of crutches. And then you change her hands and she just, like an airplane, she just opens up and away she goes. The, and I, the, by the time that Shane knew this, it was a bit too late. Mm. Look, it was an unfortunate thing. And uh, Shane is fighting out the championship, there's no doubt. He's a top-class jockey. And sure, you know, that's the way it went. Well, the, 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 I suppose the two stories for me this year, definitely, um, that stand out a mile 
um, would be sceptical because he was a rags to riches story. And unfortunately, his premature end was, you know, that that book didn't get um, fully written, I suppose, because he could have become Ireland's best sprinter. And he was gelded. He could have been this or that for many years. But you, the Princess Zoe story trumps that, Tony. And what fascinates me is I know you've been to Germany before to get horses. How did you land on her? And, you know, when she turned up that day in Avon, running off 64, who could have had any idea what was in store? So how, how did you actually acquire her in the first place for, for Pat Kyo? Yeah, well, I have this man in the two of us. We, we go through the... You see, we go through all farm. But you go to France, they want 150 grand for everything. So we haven't got that. So we sort of went to Germany because we could get horses at a better price. Like we bought Party Playboy last year and he was just touched off in the English and Sarwich. And that week then we bought this one, Princess Zoe, and uh, she came here and, you know, so we know the German farm quite well and we can buy them at a little better than, at a lot better than we can buy in France. So uh, it was finances that pushed us a bit like 30 years ago, Martin Pipe came over here and he couldn't afford to buy the horses. So he went to France and that's what opened up France to England, you know, now that every second uh, runner in England is, is a French import. It was Martin Pipe started all that. Maybe Francois Dumas came over with a horse called Nupsala and he won the King George. So, I mean, there's new frontiers the whole time and you just get up and go and find them. Before we get on to that though, could, like buyer beware, you got to go, you, you check out the car, you take it for a test drive, yeah. you get your mechanic to look under the hood. So I presume you did all that with Princess Zoe, right? Well, I didn't go, but um, we had her vetted, obviously, and she was clinically sound. But, you see, there's a difference between clinically sound and um, actually when she arrived then, she was she a was little bit uh, wrong of her confirmation and uh, quite stiff in herself. What does wrong of her confirmation mean? Uh, that, you know, her front legs are not straight like a proper athlete or if you ever heard of a, a lad with bandy legs right. she has a little bandy legs so um and but you see when the vet goes to vet her uh she's a woman vet and she said to me that um everything is clinically sound so she was in every very place out in the back of east germany if, if you remember before the Berlin Wall went down, it's out in, in the, so it's quite hard to access. And I had been out there before and it's a horrendous journey out to the back of Dresden. And uh, I said, here, if the, if the vet cert is fine, let her come on. When she arrived then, I nearly had a stroke. I rang your man in Germany. I said, here, what's this carry on? So, but at that stage we had her and she was paid for and all. So, <laughs> wait. Uh, not too happy now, but I walked away anyway. And the next thing, we did a bit of fast work with her. Rang your man, says, I forget everything I said, don't worry about it. And Tony, you, said, you wouldn't have bought this horse if you gone if we, if you were gone to Germany, would you have brought her home? No. No, I would not. She, she, she didn't walk, probably. But now she has improved a lot since she came. Gillian O'Brien uh, is my chiropractor and... and um, you know, does all the muscles and feet and uh, across her back, everything. And she has loosened her out and she has become a real a good walker now. And that. I'd say that they were probably training her on too fast a ground in Germany and it didn't suit her. We train here on quite a deep sea sand and it suits this one. So I'd say it took months of loosening out and you know, our blacksmith did little things with the feet as well. Mick Carway, he's very good. So, you know, it, there's a lot of things involved here. Yeah, first, you had to have a customer like Paddy Kyo, whose game is a gander, really. When, you know, uh, you recommend something to Paddy, he trusts you, you can go and get it done. So then, when the check is written, then when we get her, Gillian O'Brien does a good bit of work with her back. The blacksmith or farrier does a good bit of work with her feet and then I'm doing my work with her on the gallop and then along comes Joey Sheridan who to me is the next new champion 
So there's a lot of people involved here. And uh, the story has gone fantastically up to now anyway. When you think about it like that, the different layers of things that have to happen, and it's, you know, it's a, a very straightforward, which of these horses is going to run this distance in the shortest amount of time? It should be, it should all be science. When it comes down to it, the amount of information and data points that we can collect these days, it should all be science. But actually, it really isn't. It's, it's... Well, you see, look, the only thing that keeps racing alive is that it's not an exact science. If it was, the biggest checkbook would own them all. So, I mean, this is one of the great stories where a small trainer with a relatively small owner can go and buy a second-hand horse who's well exposed and come on and beat them all. So, I mean, it, it, it's the fantastic thing about racing. A couple of years ago, you had Dan Oli, uh, for Tom Foley, another brilliant horse that was came from, if you like, obscurity and was champion at all his levels right up through. And hopefully this one can do the same for us. What did you like about Princess Zoe in Germany that you'd seen, that you thought, before you actually saw the horse itself, that you thought, yeah, actually, there's enough in that in that background, in that pedigree, in that performance. Like, wh what goes into you going? I'm going to I'm going to recommend this horse. Well, uh, we looked at her um, her pedigree, and she's by a horse called Jukebox Jury, who is by Monju, and they were Monju horses. Are better put my phone on silent here. I see lads. I tell the ringing. You say, here, look, your phone's on. But. Um, it just that we feel Jukebox Jury is a stamina horse. And he's he's actually standing here in Ireland now. He's only eight or ten miles down the road. So if you have a mare, send her on. But uh, we feel he's a stamina horse. And they kept running this one over a mile and one. And as you know, last Sunday it was two and a half miles. They were running her over a mile and one on fast ground. And we brought her up to two and a half miles on heavy ground. And... Uh, we, we felt we could tell from the way she was running on at the end of these races that were too short for her, that she was crying out for a bigger distance. And I knew from the minute I got her that she wanted soft ground. That was quite obvious. So the combination of the two has brought about a massive, massive um, plot improvement in her form. I presume you actually bought her to go hurling, did you? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, we bought her to be a great horse. And, uh, you know, it, like we, when we go hurdling is when we feel we can't go any higher on the flat. Do you know what I mean? Uh, you know, to say we, we buy a jumper, we buy a horse, you, you know, a trainer like me or Willie or Tom, we, you know, we, we don't mind what it is as long as we win. And um, now that she looks to be a class horse on the flat, we're going to show the jumping for, for the moment anyway, you know. I was going to ask you that because I was I was actually talking to Joe Foley, your good friend from Ballyhane, who we had on the show not that long ago. I was talking to him, I think it was before maybe the Galway race, and he was telling me how you were kind of just you 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 discussed um, her potential value, and strangely enough, a mare as much as she's achieved in terms of her actual stud value because of her pedigree and that that stamina influence, she wouldn't maybe be quite as valuable as some would think. And at that stage. You were you were still going hurdling, I think, and the obvious race that you were going to go for at Cheltenham would have been the Dawn Run Novices Hurdle. So it's, it's it, it was actually it was almost like the best conclusion to the story that that, that could have happened, but without uh, understanding what was going to happen at Longchamp. But uh, you're telling us now that may not happen next year. No, well, it won't happen next year anyway. So uh, for this jumping season, she will not be jumping, and I doubt if she'll ever jump, but. She certainly won't for the moment. Um, we will be aiming at next year, possibly the Ascot Gold Cup. I know a lot of people think I'm crazy, but I still believe she's going to prove it at a mile and a half. And I am certainly not dismissing the Freedom Arctic Triumph at this stage. Wow. How old is she, Tony? I don't know. I should, should know that. Five. And she'll be the same age next year as the Naval was this year. So uh, they say six-year-olds haven't a, a great record. But at the rate this one is improving, like, you know, it, 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 it's just, if I could compare it to anything, it's like a, a, a junior, a special junior 
horror suddenly becoming Henry Shefflin. You know what I mean? It's it's just something I've not alone in my yard. I don't think I've ever seen it anywhere before. A horse rated sixty four coming on to win a Group One on the high <laughs> stage. You know, in, in Longchamp. <laughs> Would you even know if you had one? It was a brilliant question you were saying. You were asking. Was that was that a moment of doubt? Was that like a moment of introspection? Was that just how life is? You, like you know, until you actually see something, until you live the experience, you can imagine it, but. Yeah, well, I've often imagined, of course, like, I mean, we work seven days, seven nights a week. So, I mean, you're always dreaming of having a group one. But after 30 years and I had never even got a smell of one. And suddenly when it happened, you know, I was always wondering, would it ever happen? And then wondering, would I know if it, if, when it had happened? By God, when it happened, I knew straight away. I, I you know, my knees wobbled on them. I knew when she worked here two weeks ago before she left for France I knew that it was going to take one hell of a horse to beat us Can I ask how much you put this down to yourself because she wasn't uh, obviously well you, you had the look you had the fortune of having a horse who was obviously well handicapped and had probably been running over an inadequate trip but conversely when she arrived she obviously wasn't 100% straightforward so how much credit do you give yourself I know you're a fairly humble character but how much in terms of your training achievements, uh, is this the best? Johnny, as you know, I'm brilliant. <laughs> but I know, there's an awful amount of people. I mentioned a few of them there, like the way Jackie looks after Jackie Carter, who looks after her at home and when she travels. You have Gillian O'Brien, you have uh, Mick Carver, the blacksmith, you have Tim Brennan, the vet, you have Paddy Wright in the checks, and you have me doing my bit. I mean, the trainer's license is in my name, but the amount of people that goes into getting a group one winner, any trainer that thinks he's done it on his own is a fool. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to think I did my bit well and they did their bit well and the whole thing, you know, I mean, it's a bit like saying Brian Cody is the whole answer in Kilkenny. He is brilliant at his job. The hurlers are brilliant at their job. The county board are brilliant at bringing them through every year. So, I mean, it's, who made uh, the best Kilkenny team? I don't think, I think it's exactly what it is. It's a team. There's a huge amount in bringing, uh, like Aidan O'Brien is a brilliant trainer, Willie is a brilliant trainer, but they have vets, head lads, blacksmiths, chiropractors, um, lorry drivers that make sure the horses travel properly. All these, there's a massive combination and it's amazing after a race, they all go into the number one and you think and you just see the three people, you know, the owner, trainer and jockey. But in the background, there's a huge team and everyone has to do their job right to be the best on the best day, on the big day, like it was last week. So uh, well, I suppose what I love about it is the fact that this has been, you know, one of the most challenging years of many people's lives, I think, and it's obviously still ongoing and owners only recently were able to go racing and now they're not able to go racing and, and racing itself was called off for whatever three months and yeah, within the game you know it's been tough for people and even speaking to punters a lot of them have have struggled for winners even as since lockdown and it's just been a, a very challenging year but i think what this mayor has done for racing um for, i i don't think i've ever actually had a bet on princess zoe and the enjoyment i've gotten out of watching her i was in the butchers in rialto the other day and the fella behind the counter who would normally be talking to me about Shamrock Rovers or this and that, all he wanted to talk about was Princess Zoe. The amount of people I, who I talked to would barely have an interest in racing, and they all seem to know about Princess Zoe. And to me, it's much bigger of a story than a mare winning races against other horses. Yeah, well, you see, I suppose the Irish people as a race have always been sort of lovers of the underdog because we've been a bit that way all our lives ourselves. Uh, on the international stage. So um, they love to see the underdog coming. And here you have, as I said earlier, a small time owner, a small trainer, an apprentice jockey, and a used car, if you like, of a horse. And now she has come right to the top and won on the world stage, as we call it. So um, we, we think that we were um, nearly as famous as Bennett was the week before on the Champs-Élysées. So, I mean, it, it's amazing to see 
you know, his fantastic feat in Paris there in the Tour de France two weeks ago, and then we go back and do it again. Like, I know how big theirs is. We're so busy at ours that we probably didn't realize it. Um, but it's, it, it's just fantastic. And it makes all the years of grafting here with ordinary horses. It makes it all so worth it now. Well, let's talk a little bit about the graft because I'm, I'm really interested in it. Just to remind everybody, uh, our guest this week is Tony Mullins. This is Friday Night Racing. It's brought to you in association with Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Um, I, I did want to ask you about your training style because you talked about the, the slightly uh, deeper track that you were training on. Is that a family thing? Is that is that Do you train in the same style as your brothers? Do you train in the same style as your dad? How have you changed and evolved and, and how would you describe your own methodology um, when it comes to getting your horses ready for whatever the race is? Yeah, well, you see, uh, it, it would take me an hour and a half to really explain everything to you. But years ago, um, my father put in a very small little all-weather gallop uh, in our place. You see, where Willie is training now, that was an out farm that my father had bought years ago, years before that. But we never trained horses over there. Willie was the first to train there. And um, but when we were at home, accidentally, uh, there was a young lad who used to go to school with us, Paul Hennessy, who is now the famous dog trainer. Uh, Paul, his family, they were um, milking people. And anyway, there was a thing called a big slurry tanker it was only being invented at the time. And our gallop had got dusty during the summer. And he said he could bring up this big machine and water the gallop for us. And of course, we being young lads, of course, we way over watered it and the ground was bottomless and uh, my father went crack, so he did first. And the next thing we noticed, we were having a lot more winners. And then we discovered that uh, this quite deep ground, now you need good riders to be working in deep ground. You can't have any Johnny Joe soap riding horses. It's, it's, it's a bit of a, an art to ride horses in that type of ground. But that's what we did. And my father became champion trainer for the next 13 years at that stage. I think it was 13 years in a row he won the championship. Then Willie built his gallops over where he's training now and uh, carried on the same thing. Now, I went a little different. I went for sea sand. They, they train on um, chips and sawdust. And I went for sea sand and um, took me good few years to get it, um, you know, to get to know it, to get the right riders to ride it the way that it needs to be ridden and that. But basically, uh, we'll say the fundamentals are the same. And it just took me a long time to get to learn how to work the sand. And, uh, but essentially, we train in a ground that the horses go four to six inches deep every stride. That's amazing. So by accident, Young lads caused the birth of the greatest training dynasty in national hunt and Irish racing history. That's a remarkable story. Yeah, it is. I mean, but at the same time, now my father was um, second to old Tom Draper and to Jim Draper then when he took over in the trainers championship before this. But then I'd say that this moved them on to another level, you know. So it's amazing how things evolve uh, through mistakes through trying new things, everything, and uh, but it works well for us. But I know trainers um, who come, I, you know, Willie's is now very famous, and rightly so, but the, you know, trainers come over from England, they want to get a look at the way Willie is training in this soft ground, and they are amazed that anyone can train in that type of soft ground. But, of course, there is a technique to it now. It's not just a matter of going out and having soft ground and gallop away till the horse can stand. You've got to know how to train on that type of ground, especially with young horses, with babies, bringing them through. They're not able for that tough thing unless you do it right. And, uh, you know, to say it's easy, we, we, we find it easy now because we've been doing it for years. But um, just going out now and softening your gallop won't, <laughs> won't necessarily certainly mean that you get the winners straight away. Why? You mentioned, you know, sorry, Jerry. You, you mentioned your father, Paddy, who was obviously, you know, very groundbreaking in terms of um, a man of few words and all that. But if Paddy had been alive, what would he have said to you 
after the race in Paris? Uh, that was always his type of dream, you know. I mean, I remember when the last good filly he had on the flat vintage table, she won her maiden in Tralee first time out. And he was quite an old man at this stage. And he trotted off the stand and he caught me elbow. He says, I've been waiting for this for years. The excitement my father used to get out of the few good horses, good flat horses he had. You know, we trained jumpers and trained Don Run and Gravel and Minaret's Girl and Hungry Heart. I mean, I could name them for half an hour. But the few good flat ones he had, you know, from humble beginnings, he used to be very excited with them. Very saying that he used to, he Paddy would have been the guts of eighty at the time, and from what I recall, she was quite nervous when she was travelling. So he used to literally get into the back, get into the uh, lorry with her, and stand beside her in her travelling, so she'd be okay getting to the races and getting to work. I remember she was working up the Curra just before the Oaks, and we had you know the old double horse box you'd have behind the jeep, and he went out and painted out all the windows and the air vents and that with black paint and um, next thing loaded up the filly told one of the lads you're driving he says i'm getting in the box and he stood with her he was 84 maybe 85 he stood with her in the box the whole way to the cora and the whole way home and when my mother heard about it she went nuts and he went so of course as usual he didn't listen to her and he went to the car with her and won the Oaks. She was easy. His attention to detail like that, uh, it was amazing to watch him with horses. You know, I hear Aidan O'Brien now referring to it, and I believe he can do it. You know, Aidan O'Brien, Paddy Mullins, Willie Mullins, they can talk to horses. And everyone thinks, ah, yeah, this is the one with this old load of baloney. They can talk to horses and, uh, you know, they know them, you know, I, I, well, I feel as well that I can speak to my horses and, and get them to answer me, you know, to know how they're feeling. What kind of stuff? Sorry? What, what kind of stuff? Like, what, what, are you, what are you trying to find out from them? You know, are you well enough to, for me to be hard on you so as you can win a race next week? You know what I mean? The whole point with horses, I'm sure like athletes, I've never trained any hurlers or athletes, but the whole point is to never to push the model already to be pushed. And I mean, if you have a fit athlete, he can take, you know, you see them soccer players for Man United and might have to play three matches in the one seven days, you know, in one week. I mean, if they're not fit enough, they won't be able to do that. So, I mean, if you push a lad early in the season, maybe his knees go, or I don't know what goes with soccer players or, or hurlers or that, but if you push them when they're not ready for it, they're going to do damage. So you've got to know when you're pushing the button uh, that your project in front of you is ready for it. And, you know, that's why I'm, at the moment, I cannot draw my breath, you know, because to know, I have to decide now whether going back for this race in two weeks from next Sunday. I can work her hard because she's having a hard time already. So I have to decide for now from our easy work, whether we're in a fit state to go back on Sunday fortnight or not. And I can tell you one thing, I'm uptight about it, you know. And how do you make sure that your being uptight doesn't transmit to the horse so that when you're asking the horse and however that conversation goes, you're getting an answer that isn't, the signal isn't somehow mixed up? Yeah, well, a conversation is not really, well, you know, I mean, I ask her to do little things and I judge by her reaction. Um, you know, probably that's the vibes I get. Like, she doesn't say to me, Tony, I'm not ready. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So you're reading from the things you do with her, you watch her reactions from the amount you feed her. Uh, we'll say we conventionally give about 12 pounds in the evening feed. So I'm over and back every two hours to see how long it's taken her to eat that 12 pounds. You know, yeah. when they're very well, they will have it eaten in sort of four hours. If they only barely have it eaten before breakfast tomorrow morning at half six, then you know that, uh, you know, see, all these little things, 
I watch her when she goes out on the gallop. Is she hyper? Which means that, you know, maybe her blood is a little high. Or is she dead in herself? That is she tired? And then again, of course, with a female, you have the, the worry of her coming in season. But I think we've checked her now and her, her in-season cycle will be next week, which will give us a full week and a half into the race. So there's a, you know, I could go on here for two hours about the, the little things that you read into. And uh, I was delighted. Uh, I saw Edna Brown being interviewed somewhere lately. And you know, and you imagine it's always easy for someone like Aidan, uh, you know, with all these facilities. And I was just delighted to hear him say, if you're not there, hour in, hour out, every day, you will not make a success of it. And I sort of, you know, I just said to myself, like, you know, I, I realize it anyway, that, that the checkbook just doesn't make them win. Checkbook might give you the better horses to train, but by God, you have to be a good trainer to make them win. I, I think you're, you're giving a good indication. Well, I firmly believe that people who don't necessarily get racing or haven't fallen for it, these strange people who haven't fallen in love with racing, yes, I think the best way almost racing could sell itself is to show that person what goes on in the yard over the course of a day or over the course of a week and the relationship between not only the horse and the trainer, but the horse and the ladder girl looking after the horse. And that goes way beyond sport because it's a special thing. Um, you know, and the more, the more, the, the more, the older I get, the more I, I appreciate animals. And, you know, we, we, we forget sometimes that we're only one species of eight, whatever it is, million in the world. And horses are so special as well, Tony. And I suppose you've been around them all your life, but every day is different as well. And every animal is different and has different cares and needs well the first thing that drives me mad and really turns me off a person is a person who believes that a horse is a dumb animal i mean that just drives me off my head horses are very very intelligent and uh, you know it, it, the dumb person that's looking at them that thinks that because they can't read the reactions of the horse i mean uh, I'm, I only said to somebody last night that the one thing about a horse, he hasn't got within his DNA to be dishonest. When I hear people say, no, he's a dog, he's a very dishonest horse. What he has is a problem that the human can't decipher. It's not within a horse's DNA. Unfortunately, it's in the human DNA to be dishonest, but it's not in a horse's. And any horse that's refusing to do something is because you haven't realized what his problem is and go about fixing it. And I am adamant on that. I know it for sure. When you were a jockey, was it your intention to become a trainer always? Did you kind of grow up thinking, jockey first, I'll do that as long as I can, and then I'll become a trainer? I tell you, most lads plan out their life. I think my plan at 12 was get out of school anyway. Whatever you do, get out of here. This is not suiting you. And I always dreamed of horses and dreamed of riding horses. And uh, I had a great life at it. Uh, really loved it. Very lucky to be riding for my father, you know, riding very good horses, the likes of Dawn Run and those. And there's stories in and out and that. But generally speaking, I loved it. And then suddenly, uh, I got a couple of bad falls near the end with my back and uh, I ended up training quite young. Um, I shouldn't have been training as early as that, but um, I just couldn't stick the pain in my back anymore. And um, I, I was retired, at, I think I only rode about five winners the last year. So effectively I was retired at 30. You know, they're riding up to 42 now. So, um, I started training then, then I realized what seven days, seven nights working was and um, it's been a long, long haul and the relief of getting a real good horse now is just something, you, you know, you just can't put it into words. Were there ever any doubts along the way that this was what you wanted to do or like, you know, if it, I can see just how much it, it means to you to have Princess Zoe now. when. 
there must have been some dark times when the horses weren't performing and whatever you were doing wasn't working. Did you ever think of saying, right, I'm going to do something completely different or I'm going to get into a different aspect of the game? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I certainly would never leave horses. That's for sure. Because uh, they're, I think they're my mental therapy. I love relating to horses. Even speaking to old retired horses out here, old Pedro Bob is still out here. And uh, I often go and talk to him in, in the paddocks and that. And, you know, just horses is what I'm made for. I just, I love them. So I don't think I ever, but I mean, the financial strain of training there during the recession was phenomenal. It set me back, you know, many years. And to be getting going again now in the last three or four years has been a huge relief. It was very worrying there. 12, 13, 14, 15, maybe even 2016. We got going again then with a few horses, a um, few nice horses. And uh, now, you know, life is not an easy street, but it's viable. Where I would say that for four years running, I lost quite a lot of money that I didn't have to lose. Mm. I guess coming up as well from the, like, frequently being involved in the family business and I know it's not exactly the same business but it is the same business in many respects because uh, the horses move obviously but there's a responsibility that the, the the children feel a responsibility to continue in the line and that somehow coming out of the family business would be an emotional thing that you'd somehow you know you hadn't done enough service well, um yeah, I suppose um, when you're having a bad time and, you know, a quiet time, uh, it, it, you're so busy trying to get back, you don't notice it. And then I suppose the relief uh, when they get going again, you you uh, maybe look back and say, God, thanks for the God, I got going again. Said, this is a tough game. Many people have come in and set up their their life in this game and be gone out of it in three or four years. And you see, years ago, that was okay when you got up around the field, but now with walkers and all weather gallops and that, like it's several hundred thousand to invest to become a trainer now. To go out of business in five years is a serious, serious thing, you know? So it's it, uh, the financial investment now towards years ago when we didn't even have a helmet to ride out when I was starting. The, you know, it's, it's, it's a very different game. It's a very professionalized game. And uh, you see, a lot of people don't realize we are, in, in, Irish people are very successful uh, as a whole, but in our, our horse industry is the, top, it's the one thing that Ireland can say we are the best in the world at. We, we are the best breeders. I believe we have the best trainers and jockeys, and we have the best horses. Now that, um, going back to the famous um, stallion incentive, tax-free stallion incentive thing that Charlie Hockey brought in in the late 60s, early 70s, which took about 30 years for it to grow. But now we have, through Coolmore, uh, Rathbury, uh, different studs, Bally Lynch is now becoming um, a huge stud here in Mount Juliet. I mean, these are world leaders now. These are not just successful in Ireland. They are the producers of the best thoroughbreds in the world. So this is a phenomenal thing, uh, horse racing. And a lot of people, a lot of people that don't know racing say, oh, you can't go near that horsey set. They have their own old way. And some people can be guilty of that. I got it. It is some, as long as you don't get caught up in the gambling side of it, it is some fun. Johnny can tell you they're not going racing, uh, you know, that, that for the excitement that it gives him. And he never sat on a horse, probably. Did you, Johnny? Your audio's off there, Johnny. Sorry, uh, sorry, Tony. I, 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 I've sat on a horse a couple of times just. Uh, Something that I, one of the things that I'd, I'd, I'd love to get into, like, because, uh, you know, I, I understand how how so, how so difficult it is, but uh, just like you're saying, just the, the game itself. And it is sad how we've had this year where that kind of social aspect of it has, has been gone, but um, it's, 
it's it's a fantastic game, and I think for the the story of Princess Zoe, um, that's why we're in it. You don't need to be uh, to be back in horses to enjoy that. And you you mentioned your mother as well, and I'm sure she must have gotten a great kick out of that. The, the last time I heard you mention her was how she came back from Cheltenham Ruin that she didn't back all of Willie's winners, but this must have given her a great kick. Oh sure, I, I was only talking to her about an hour ago, and. Um... You know, at her age now, at 92 or just 92, and she said, do you know, Tony? She says, I don't know what this virus is about. She, she says, if I got it anyway, she says, why just didn't they let me go to Paris? And, you know, she loves Paris and has always done when my father trained winners there years ago. And uh, Paris to her, is, oh, yeah, and I said, look, you could get the virus. And she said, wouldn't Paris be a lovely place to die? <laughs> <laughs> so that's what it means to her as well. So you know, the excitement around the whole thing um, for her, and you know, as Willie said the other day, he was shouting at the telly at home. And there's another thing that I never thought. Here's Paddy Kyo and his sister Philomena, and they own the most exciting horse we'll say in Irish racing at the moment. You know, the best story. And last Saturday was the first time they saw her running. I mean, it's hard to believe that you own one of the great horses or the great stories of the season. And that was the first time they saw her. And it looks like if we go back in two weeks' time, they mightn't get to go. I think racing will go ahead, but the, the owners have been stopped here again in Ireland. Now, and look, to say that uh, Irish racing have done a brilliant job to keep this game going, and now this has become frustrating again, but... Hats off to the health people and Dr. Jennifer Pugh and all those that are doing Irish racing there, uh, are doing the, the health thing around it. And it, it's fantastic that we're still racing. So hats off to them. But it's still very frustrating to think that Paddy Kyo and his sister own one of the greatest stories of the season. And they had to go to Paris to see her for the first time. It is a real pity. Hopefully that will, you know, I don't know what's going to happen next. Obviously the, the country, uh, the figures aren't going the right way at the moment. Tony, I had one last thing I wanted to ask you about, and that was um, with Dawn Run. You mentioned uh, a couple of times earlier on, you know, uh, the good and the bad. Um, obviously fantastic to be so close to such an amazing horse and to be involved with such an amazing horse. But there's also a bit, little bit of heartbreak for you, or maybe a bit of sweetness is, is a better way of talking about Dawn Run actually winning the Gold Cup. Oh, uh, well, like, I mean... You know, the first thing anyway was, uh, everyone was asking me, was I disappointed? I was disappointed not to ride her, but you have to remember, because our family had won the Gold Cup, so it was hugely exciting. Uh, having won 15 races on her, it was disappointing. I suppose I was so young at the time, I really thought I'd win the Gold Cup the following year or the year after that on some other horse anyway. I just didn't realise that it was going to take me 34 years <laughs> to get one on the flat, you know, not to talk of, you know, something to win the Gold Cup. So um, I was probably so young at the time that I wasn't as disappointed. Uh, and to say it'd be bitter is wrong. But, um, you know, looking back now, uh, I'd love to have my uh, trophy there to say I won the Gold Cup honour. So it is disappointing. So for people, who, for people who are unfamiliar, you, you were the jockey that was most associated with Dawn Run all the way up to Cheltenham in, in 86, is that right? Yeah, well, uh, when John Joe went out on her that day for the Gold Cup, nobody had ever sat on her in a steeplechase race, only me. So I was jocked down um, just for the Gold Cup, and which she had, and also I was jocked down for the champion hurl two years beforehand, albeit earlier in the season. So John had two or three spins on our over hurls before he got to the champion hurl. But then I was flying on our over fences until that famous day in January, leading up to the Gold Cup, where we went over to give her a look at the English fences. And uh, I got unseated and remounted and finished fourth and all that. But um, so as John Joe came to the start that day, and no one had ever ridden her in a chase, only me. So from that point of view, it was disappointing. But look, if she got beat, we'd probably never be talking about this. So, I mean, to be associated with the Great Dawn Run is, you know, and I remember 
my own little um, great days with her. I won the French champion hurl on her, which was uh, bow tie is only literally less than a kilometre away from Longchamp. It's on the other side of the Bay de Boulogne. So, you know, I've had some great days with her disappointed that I wasn't uh, on her in the Gold Cup. And who makes that call ultimately on the day or in the build-up to it? Well, obviously my father didn't jack me down. It was uh, the woman who owned it, Mrs Hill. And uh, I think she always felt that John Joe was the man for the big day. So it was disappointing. You know, I had been champion jockey the previous year or joint champion with Frank Berry in the championship and I had obviously got on very well with Don Owen. I had won nearly nearly every time I rode him and uh, so it was disappointing but look that's 34 years ago and we won't worry about it. I know it's not even, it's, it's almost like these things all go to make the character who you are who becomes the trainer ultimately and I wonder does it have an influence on in how you speak with jockeys and how you communicate with owners all that kind of stuff it, it, you know we're, we are uh, obviously an amalgamation of all the things that we experience. Yeah. Somebody said to me lately that experience is an amalgamation of all your failures. <laughs> so, I don't know. It wasn't Shakespeare, no, but somebody <laughs> said that to me. And, uh, you know, we are really. I mean, we, we, we've the things that uh, you aren't as successful at, uh, if you can, if, if you can cut out the little things that mistakes, eventually it'll all come together as the right thing, you know. Yeah, no, hundred percent. And so, while you wrestle with the decision, it sounds like from the way you've kind of dropped into conversation about the owners potentially seeing uh, Princess Zoe again in Paris, that you're leaning towards putting her out again in two weeks. I want to go. And uh, again, now I don't want to be getting into this horse talk thing, but I mean, it's the filly I have to ask if she's able to go. I want to go. I want to go next Sunday and the Sunday after. I want to go as long as she's able or we believe she's able, we want to go. And that will um, yeah. be the pre Royal Oak, which is the French Saint Ledger. And that's on Sunday fortnight. So it's about. 16 days from now so it's quite a tight thing to ask if really you know she has to go to england stay overnight and then go down the channel tunnel and onto the train and over to paris so it's, it's quite an arduous uh, journey to do twice in a month and then to run in these um distance races on soft ground so it's going to be a big ask but the one thing about princess zoe is she hasn't let us down yet and hopefully if we travel, she won't let us down this time. When you're, when you're talking about Dawn Run as well, just we'll say she, when she won the Gold Cup, in, it was 1986, and Ireland was, um, I was only a kid, but I think the likes of yourself who, who remember it, Ireland wasn't in a great way, um, and I think she was a mayor that lifted a nation in many, in, in many ways that needed a lift, um, winning the Gold Cup. And um, it was funny after the race, I was, on, uh, I was actually on the football show but uh, as is my want, I, I I couldn't take my eyes off the race because it was just it was honestly one of the most memorable, if drawn out, finishes in a flat race or any race I'll ever see. But uh, went on to the WhatsApp to check all these texts were coming in about Princess Zoe and all this, and Paul Byrne, who would have had horses with Willie and Emmett, obviously, um, he just texted into the group and he said the mayor is beginning to get up, and yeah. uh, I just thought it was a beautiful way of putting it because nobody who ever um, watch the replays of Peter O'Sullivan's commentary, we'll, we'll ever forget those lines. Yeah, I mean, that's, it, it, so many people have said that to me since, that, you know, usually uh, in flat races, um, it's over quite quickly, but to look down that long straight in Longsham and she was etching, etching closer, etching closer, and then just to get up on the line, it was, you know, it's a fairy tale, especially, you know, a bit like Don Run going to the last that day in the Gold Cup, it looked like she was beaten. And then the famous line from Peter O'Sullivan, the mayor is beginning to get up. And that's when everyone went crazy. And it seems to be that um, 
can say so he has created the same reaction which I'm delighted about well it's come full circle Tony Mullins it's been a brilliant hour in your company I would happily listen to you for an hour and a half or two hours explaining the nuances and the differences between the gallops but it's been really fascinating so continued success and very rarely we do get the opportunity to say the whole country is behind you but certainly in a couple of weeks time if you're back in Paris the whole country will be behind you well, I'd say they're behind Princess Zoe, and again I say I'm right behind her. Great stuff, Tony. Thanks a million. Thank you. This is uh, Friday Night Racing on uh, Off the Ball, and it is brought to you in association with Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. If uh, you want to get in touch, use the hashtag uh, Love Every Racing or Every Racing Moment. Now. Um, Starting Monday was the horse we were on last week, Johnny. Failed to deliver a payday for the Tote Irish Injured Jockeys Fund last Saturday, finishing fourth in Tipperary. The fund currently sits at €2,230. We have another €100 bet for uh, a Tote charity bet this weekend. A reminder, of course, the Tote.ie customers can get the Tote guarantee, Tote versus SP, on all Irish and UK racing. Check out Tote.ie for more. Where are we going? Yeah, the, the start of Monday, I kind of I, I nearly um, wrote its death warrant, um, signed its death warrant beforehand by saying that the draw could kill it, and it's exactly what happened, but definitely one to keep uh, to keep on side. I'm going to back at the next year, hopefully it gets a better draw. Uh, Joseph O'Brien just won the big Phillies race with the two-year-old there, pretty gorgeous uh, in Newmarket, and I think he can take the Dewhurst tomorrow with Thunder Moon, who was sensational in winning the national stakes at the Curra, an absolutely amazing performance. Only only uh, concern is the ground, but um, it's probably not as bad. It's probably drying out a bit in Newmarket, and he must be fairly confident he'll handle it. Um, and with all due respect to Aidan O'Brien, uh, I think if Aidan trained this horse, he'd be a lot shorter. And I, I think Joseph can train. Joseph wouldn't be many miles from Tony Mullins um, down the road there in, in Tipperary. Um, and, uh, yeah, very exciting horse, 2.55 tomorrow at Newmarket. OK, what kind of odds are you looking at? Threes thereabouts, um, but like looks to me looks like the Guineas winner next year is if he can physically progress. He was absolutely sensational at the Cora. Form was working out. He the pocket he got out of to win the race was. I, I just I advise anyone to watch it, but uh, yeah, so he's he's very exciting. Okay, so just uh, give us the full name and time again tomorrow. Thunder Moon in the two fifty five. It's it's the Dewhurst, so it's. Obviously, it's top-level stuff uh, from one grade one winning trainer, Tony Mullins, to another, hopefully, in that neck of the woods. But, yeah, it's a, it's a cracking race. But, yeah, this horse looks an absolute machine. All right, Johnny, good stuff. That is another Friday Night Racing in the books. We broadcast live every Friday afternoon from 3 o'clock across all of Off The Ball's social channels. That's at Off The Ball on Twitter, youtube.com forward slash Off The Ball. The best place to get us these days is on the OTB Sports app. And then, we're, of course, again, every Friday evening from 8 on News Talk. I really hope you enjoyed Tony Mullins. We definitely did. It was a uh, good crack and certainly um, a real insight into what that has been a life well lived in racing and now at the moment just cresting to its peak with Princess So We will obviously preview that race in a couple of weeks time once we get the declarations in as well. But another Friday Night Racing is in the books for this week. We'll see you next week. Take care. Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie.